<laughs> so first of all, I want to say, Funying Gudi FII priority Hengang. So the rest of my talk is going to be in English. Uh, one of the most important, oh, thank you. One of the most important lessons I learned when I was young is I was struggling with advanced mathematics, and my teacher told me something. It's nearly 40 years ago that I haven't forgotten, and that was that if you truly understand a thing, you don't need to remember it. Uh, and it, this is something that has stuck with me through my whole life, and it's more important now than ever, particularly in the age of AI. Many years after that, I was writing my first novel. And in my novel, you know, I learned this lesson when I was in a small town in Ireland. And in my novel, 30 years later, I'm living in the United States, and I wanted to write about a character from Ireland who was going to move out into the global community and try to find connections with other people in the global community, connections between Ireland and China, connections between Ireland and the United States, and that kind of thing. And I started researching some of the ancient history of each of these countries to try and find connections between them. And what I found when I started researching this was like, for a small country like Ireland, there's not a lot of ancient history. Because a country like that was invaded over and over and over again, and any writings that there were were effectively lost. Uh, today, we have archaeologists digging back into the past to try and figure out what happened in those ancient cultures, but there's no records, or there's very, very few records. And as a result, there's all of this cultural identity, all of these lessons from history that have been lost over time. Now, what struck me from that is that in the modern age, we have the same uh, problem, but for opposite reasons. In the modern age, we have so much writing. Uh, there is so much information being produced. And then if you're a smaller culture or if you're a smaller country, you can be lost in the noise. Even today, not just the amount of noise from like, larger countries, but the amount of noise from nonsense that's been created. Uh, about 60% of information that's being posted on Web 2.0 um, is generally produced by bots. It's not produced by people. And that number is increasing all the time. So it's very easy for anything that is not mainstream to be lost in all of that noise. And that, to me, is, a, is, is a, it's just it's tragic. Right? It, there is a great danger there of if you are a country like Ireland or Singapore or Hong Kong or you know, if you're not like uh, North America, Western Europe, India or China, you know, there's, a, there's a possibility that your culture, your songs, your poems, your stories, your recipes, all of these things can be lost in all of that noise. So how do we fix that? Well, there's one really interesting technology that we've all heard of that's come around in the last year um, that we call generative AI. We've all probably heard of ChatGPT. Most of us have probably used ChatGPT. At Google, we've worked on BARD. And uh, just this week, we released a model called Gemini. Um, and these tend to be labeled as generative AI. But let me tell you a little secret about this stuff. The generative part of it is really just a side effect. The point of these technologies wasn't always about being generative. It was about being able to understand content. And if you start looking at the trends that are moving in the, like if you look at the videos that we released, for example, recently around Gemini, the whole goal of that was to say, if you look at the content that's in this image or that the person's writing or that the person's drawing, we're trying to build algorithms that can understand that. It's less about artificial intelligence and more about artificial understanding. Now, there's two um, ways that this can be used that we're generally not thinking about. Sorry, I'm pivoting my talk. This isn't exactly what I prepared, but based on the feedback that we just had when Richard did the Q&A, I wanted to kind of pivot this a little bit to things that I think could be useful for society. Now, two parts of this. So the, the underlying technology in this stuff is something called transformers. And the idea of transformers, as the name suggests, is that they're really used for transforming one piece of text into another. And when you can understand the patterns that transform one piece of text into another, you begin to understand that text itself. So for example, if I speak a little Irish on stage now, I'll say the, the phrase, it's my unfaked of Lesh na Garakig. And if there's any Gaelic speakers in the audience uh, who can translate that, uh, there are some, uh, that actually literally translates into, the raven loves its chicks. Now, if I were to come to you and say, hey, the raven loves its chicks, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But in English, that translates into beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
Um, so when you translate, you know, if you were to do a statistical translation or a literal translation without understanding the sentiment, it's my hunfirk of Lesh Nagarikig would translate into the raven loves its chicks. And that's why machine translation, until just a few years ago, was really, really bad. Uh, the idea of machine translation using transformers now to learn and understand the sentiment in text has made it a lot better because it's understanding the sentiment in the original text. And so this, when we start thinking about how these transformer architectures can be used and when we start building and break out of the mold of thinking about this as generative AI, but thinking about it as artificial understanding, now we can start seeing that we have some of the keys here to be able to build models and build infrastructures that preserve and understand culture. Like my old teacher told me, understanding is less important. Than, oh, sorry, um, if you understand something, you don't need to always remember it. You don't need to manage piles of information to be able to uh, preserve a culture. All you have to do is understand it. And now we have algorithms and technologies that can be used to artificially understand a culture. And then the second part of this, and the other part of the, the two secrets that I was going to say around generative AI, that's not just generative, it's also a massively efficient way of compressing information. Um, if you think about something like the most famous one at the moment, ChatGPT, you know, generally it's seen as having around 200 billion parameters. Now, that sounds like a really big number, but if you think about each of those parameters, it's going to be four bytes, so you're talking about 800 billion bytes, so it's, what, 80 gigabytes or something like that, if my math is right. But that has been able to compress the entire information of the training set that was used on that, which is much of the internet, lots of, lots of books, lots of other sources like GitHub source code, and all of those kind of things, into that small amount. And it's able to like, effectively understand and create text you know, on anything. You can go to that and ask it to write a haiku. You can go to that and ask it to help you with your movie scripts, you know, all of these kind of things. They can get much smaller when they're used for something that's specialized. Uh, this week, we just announced Gemini, and the Gemini Nano has only got 100 million parameters, which is going to be about, I think, about 40 megabytes. So that's tiny in modern terms, and the storage for that is getting smaller and smaller. So as you start thinking about training a model for a specific individual task, for example, preserving a culture, now the task is less about the technology and more about just simply curating the data. And the nice thing about the transformer-based way of doing it, particularly as it compresses the information, say, for example, you end up in your data set having 100 different recipes for Irish stew, it's not going to have to store 100 different documents. The transformer will understand the context of this ingredient goes into this stew, this ingredient goes, you cook it this way, that type of thing. So, to me, this is one of the greatest green fields that's out there with this tech. This is one of the things that I'm personally working on. What do we do when we break out of just the shell of thinking about generative AI as something that just generates information for you and look underneath the hood and see what's actually in there? Um, with the FII, uh, we're working on um, preservation of culture, like I just mentioned. And like I meant, this is going to be one of the keys of being able to do that. I think we have a wonderful opportunity in front of us to be able to condense culture into a simple, single, small model that people can interact with. In the cases of, we, we spoke earlier about education, that places that don't have access to massive cloud compute, these models are going to fit on a phone. They're not going to need uh, internet connectivity. 100, billion, 100 million parameters will work phone, fit on your phone, no problem. And now we can actually have people being able to interact with these things on a small device like a phone or a laptop or a Chromebook, uh, where they can now interact with their culture, learn about their culture, understand their culture, and then ultimately preserve it in the long term. I think we have an opportunity in front of us to build a legacy for the future. That to, there's never been a better time than today to do this kind of thing. And I think someday we'll be looking back on the year 2023 and we'll be saying, wasn't that a great time? Wasn't it a great time? Because that was when we were given the keys to be able to make massive changes like this quickly, easily, cheaply, and without needing like, you know, billions of dollars to do it. This is something that a few developers on a laptop, if given the right data, would be able to do themselves. And, you know, and I think the, the conversations that we're having at a summit such as this one, the people that we're meeting with each other, the networking that we're doing at a summit such as this one, it's really the things that can grease the wheels of that. And I'd really encourage you all to look into it. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Thank you.